Okay, we'll call the meeting to order, please. Can I have a mover and seconder to call the meeting to order? Deputy Mayor Coughlin and Councillor Cabral, that the regular meeting of the Council of Springwater, July 8, 2.20, come to order at 6.30 p.m. All those in favor? Carried. Due to COVID, Council is taking the necessary steps to li limit in-person meetings. Some members of Council will be are participating electronically, and the meeting is live streamed. So we have two councillors here, myself and Deputy Mayor Coughlin, who are physically distanced, and the other councillors are participating virtually over the, over the Zoom. Uh, as the admin centre is closed to the public, residents are provided with the following options to watch or listen to the council meeting. So you can watch the meeting live on the township website at www.springwater.ca. You can listen to the meeting uh, live from a telephone uh, calling 647-558-0588 and using the meeting ID identification 831-5161-1460 and then the pound sign after that. This option is only available during the meeting. And then finally, those who are unable to watch the live stream can review the meeting at their convenience by watching the video on the Township's YouTube channel. Are there any uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest tonight, Council? Okay. First off, we have a presentation uh, by Brian DeLonghi, uh, who's joining us electronically via Zoom with his uh, request for EpiPens to be placed on Springwater Fire Service vehicles. Mr. DeLonghi, welcome. I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, or like you heard, my name is Brian DeLonghi and I'm here representing my whole family, Joanne Van Der Hoven. Um, I kind of want to give you all a little bit of background. So thank you to all me members of, or sorry, residents of Springwater, councillors, mayor, deputy mayor, and, and everyone on all other stakeholders. I want to take this second just to inform people a little bit about anaphylaxia. First things first, it's not just an allergy, it's a hypersensitive allergy. A lot of people know a lot about it. And when we first dealt with it with our older daughter who's seven, people were like, oh, it's just a little bit of peanut in it, they'll be okay. And we sort of dealt with, and these are well-educated people, some of them in the health field. As much as a peanut coming into contact with their food is enough to cause a reaction. To be clear, what is anaphylaxic, an anaphylaxic shock? it is a hypersensitive attack due to very small amounts of an allergen all right they are absolutely life-threatening all right you can you might sense a little bit of passion in my voice when i do talk about it my younger daughter has a number of allergies most of the nut family peanuts uh sesame and and others anyways with all that in mind i'll just take a second to give you a little background bear with me um the big thing about it is in an anaphylactic shock, seconds count. And it's not a matter of minutes, it is a matter of seconds. And I've chosen EpiPen, that's the brand we use. I do have one in front of me in a case. They're very, very simple to use. EpiPen is made by Pfizer. There are other brands out there. I know there have been recalls and all sorts of things. If I say EpiPen, it's no affiliation with Pfizer whatsoever. That's just the uh, kind of the vernacular that I'll be using there. Um, to put it into perspective, there's about two and a half million Canadians who suffer with anaphylaxis right now. There's about 3,500 Canadians going anaphylactic shock annually. That number sounds quite low from other research. I'm just quoting this from one article I found. And dozens or more will die annually because of it. One of the big things about, and this is mostly dealing with food allergies, it's most prevalent in younger kids where right now under the age of three, about 6% of kids have anaphylactic allergies to food. All right, that doesn't include bee stings and some of the other common allergens. The fact is food allergies have increased. I've got the one stat, 350% from 1996 to 2002. I know that's a bit of an older stat, but that growth has continued to grow. Nuts allergies and peanut allergies have grown substantially over that time and just 
a regular part of my life is checking food aller, um, food labels and that sort of thing. The reality is people with those allergies will have an attack. Despite our vigilance, our house is completely free of those allergens. We don't keep anything in the house that might possibly cause an allergy, but it could still be in other products. Some products will say may contain nuts, peanuts, sesame, whatever it is. You can't actually take that risk. So just getting a feel for it. One of the first things I noticed was how the fire stations in um, our township are spread out. You have Midhurst, Minnesing, Hillsdale, and Elm Bell stations really doing a great job of servicing the area and being geographically well located. Our area is quite spread out geographically. Looking at ambulance services provided by Simcoe County, it seemed more we had a periphery of actual ambulance stations. Uh, luckily, Elmvale just came into play, was it six months ago? Whatever it was. Um, and I noticed one of the things, even on Simcoe's website, they were talking about the fact that they've added rapid response units and they're working at different ways to try and actually deal with the fact that we are so far spread that getting to a call will take a certain amount of time. For that reason, I, I've done a lot of research. I've talked to uh, Mr. Kirk. I'm glad, thank you for coming, uh, Chief Kirk. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out, I read this, I've quoted a few articles in the uh, presentation that I've got. First one was from Oshawa. Uh, fire services would actually come to calls. They would not be allowed to administer an Abbey event. Uh, again, uh, Chief Kirk might be able to respond to that. They were actually to direct the person to give it to themselves, especially when you're talking about younger children. That scared the heck out of me. Furthermore, there's all sorts of scenarios uh, in Clarington, Mississauga, rural. And again, I'll let you guys go through those. I won't give you all the details because we can obviously read. Um, what I would like to see is a bridge between the gap in response times between ambulance service and fire services. The fact is, with the many number of people in our area that do have these allergies, fire services are getting there first. And not by a matter of seconds or minutes, but like 10, 15, 20 minutes sooner. For that reason, and it's this is very common throughout Ontario, most regions, and again, I named a few in there, from rural to quite urban centers are now carrying EpiPens in their fire trucks. It is a fairly low cost um, plan and it will save lives. Watching those presentations earlier today, seeing what an what environment, wonderful environmental area we have, the area is growing rapidly and that's just in residents and in tourism, especially at this time of the year. I live right off Crossland, which is the gateway to Wasega and the thousands and thousands of cars that drive through there. I just see a need for this in terms of saving lives in the future. I would happily answer any questions you guys have about that. Thank you, Brian. Um, <clears throat> before we uh, start discussion on this, uh, can I have a mover and second to uh, get this on the floor? Councillor Cabral, Councillor Ma Chapman. And uh, so, um, Councillor Cabral. There we go. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Allen. Uh, I, I, uh, I did want to speak to this because I know with our district ambulance services, as, as well as the fire services, well, from a personal experience, I can tell you the fire service is phenomenal. But um, uh, quite often, um, you've got two different agencies that could be responding uh, depending on what they're already attending to given what emergency might be existing. But um, I, I kind of uh, understand this. I, I see this very, very much along the same lines as, uh, you know, the, 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 the Loxone kits um, for, uh, for the opioid issue. Um, I mean, there's even private citizens that carry those. Now those kits are, are available free, but um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful because uh, my understanding is that there there are a number of uh, fire departments out there that do carry the EpiPens. And uh, to be quite honest, just from my past experience, uh, my past career, um, looking back on it, uh, I could certainly see where carrying the EpiPen 
uh, would certainly uh, come in handy. And uh, as uh, Mr. DeLonghi said, certainly um, provide life-saving opportunity for somebody that was uh, experiencing anaphylactic shock. And uh, just uh, once again, from personal experience, I used to go to a summer camp for children and uh, one of the gals from Toronto uh, had a severe allergy to peanuts. Not that they even had to be in the room, but if they'd been on the counter a day or two before, that's how absolutely sensitive she was to that. And she had to carry uh, her pen with her all the time and her partner carried her, carried one as well. So from my standpoint, I'd love to hear what uh, Chief Kirk might be able to add to this if he's got any background information. But uh, I think it's certainly something that uh, we as a council and as a community should be considering. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll go to Chief Kirk and then I'll go to uh, Councillor Ma. Chief Kirk. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, through you to the rest of council. Just to um, um, further um, carry on with uh, some of the comments that uh, Mr. DeLonghi uh, made. Um, yes, he's correct. Any citizen can administer an EpiPen. Um, because they're protected under the Good Samaritan Act. They're trying to help. Uh, whereas in emergency services, unfortunately, we fall under uh, a delegated medical act. So it's not as simple as um, the fire department uh, just picking up some EpiPens and away we go. So we would have to fall under a, a medical delegated act, which would fall under in the Sim Simcoe County, it would fall under Dr. Feldman. Um, Further to this, um, in order to do that, we would have to do the uh, county uh, first aid training and the epi pen training that they provide at no charge. Uh, the only cost associated with the, uh, the training would obviously be wages for our firefighters. So uh, again, uh, Brian met, met with me my first week of uh, employment and I did uh, say I would support it. I think it's a good cause. I'm well versed in both epi and uh, naloxone uh, from my past department. Um, and I think it would provide a, a good service to the citizens and visitors to uh, Springwater. Thank you, Councillor Ma. Thank you, Mayor Allen, and thank you, uh, Mr. DeLong. I think it's a great um, opportunity for this. I think the fire truck should be carrying them. Um, so I would like to support this and make an amendment to um, the delegation um, that uh, be directed to back to staff to report on the cost implications of the um, spring water fire services um, for the EpiPen. And I'd also like to add, if possible, maybe the save stations can carry one. I'm not sure about the temperature where that sits, but it's also a great opportunity to keep it in there if anyone can administer it. And if it, the cost is a good savings, if we buy in bulk, so maybe we can look at both of those. So I would like to make an amendment to the delegation. Okay, um, who who's the mover on that? Uh, who's the mover on that? Councillor Cabral. Cabral, Councillor Cabral, you're you're in sync with the amendment, yes? Mayor Allen. Um, I do have an amendment written up, uh, moved by Councillor Chapman. Okay. Um, and it, if it could be duly seconded, and then it would be an official amendment to the uh, okay. receipt of the delegation. Are you seconding? <clears throat> Mayor Allen. Yes. Could I uh, just speak on the save stations? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Um, I I was aware of the uh, the the uh, the uh, Councillor Ma Chapman's. Uh, um, bringing forward this and I, I did some research into the save stations and it's my understanding that the save stations are all outside um, and it would be a challenge to keep um, uh, epinephrine in those cabinets yes. because epi has to be stored at room temperature however I did find out in speaking with the paramedic services that I think there's a number of our public facilities and I could be wrong on this but um, they have the public access defibrillators inside the buildings, which some municipalities are starting to uh, um, have epi and uh, uh, naloxone in those cabinets. So that's something to think about in the future if we don't have the pad uh, uh, devices in, in the uh, community halls and, and so on and so forth. So 
Um, I just wanted to bring uh, that to everybody's attention that the EPI would be a challenge in the safe stations. Okay, thank you for that. So, uh, <clears throat> Clerk uh, Ainsworth? Um, may I suggest to Councillor Chapman um, that the end of your amendment state and review the possibility of inclusion of EpiPens in safe stations and uh, public access defibrillators? Sure. Okay. So could you read that please in entirety? That the motion now before council be amended as follows. Add and that staff be directed to report on the cost implications of Springwater Fire Services carrying EpiPens in emergency vehicles and review the possibility of inclusion of EpiPens in safe stations and public ac access defibrillators. Okay. All those in favor? That is carried. Do you have to read the main motion? Go ahead. Uh, the main motion would read that the delegation from B Brian DeLonghi requesting that EpiPens be placed in Springwater Fire Service vehicles be received and that staff be directed to report on the cost implications of Springwater Fire Services carrying EpiPens in emergency vehicles and review the possibility of including EpiPens in save stations and PADs. Okay, all those in favor, that is carried. Thank you, and thank you again, Mr. DeLonghi, for the delegation. Thank you very much, people. Everyone, I really appreciate it. Okay, so moving on to question period, uh, item four. Uh, members of the public are invited to ask questions of council or make comments regarding an item on the agenda. Uh, in an effort to accommodate the question period, the following process is followed. Members of the public wishing to submit questions or comments shall do so by 4.30 p.m. Uh, today by contacting the clerk's department. Clerk Ainsworth, please provide counsel with any questions or comments that have been received for this meeting. Uh, thank you. One question was received uh, from Hale Mahone of 33 Hillview Crescent in Midhurst. Um, and the question reads, I would like to provide my comments on item 7.3 of the July 8th meeting of council, Heritage Evaluation Midhurst Community Centre. I disagree with the Heritage Committee's recommendation not to designate the Midhurst Community Hall as a, reg as a heritage property. According to the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture, a heritage designation recognizes the importance of a property to the local community, protects the property's cultural heritage value, encourages good stewardship and conservation, and promotes knowledge and understanding about the property. In the case of the Midhurst Community Hall, all four of these criteria will be met. A heritage designation will recognize its community importance as a community hub for numerous groups to meet, events to be hosted, and meetings to be held. It will protect its cultural heritage value as a pillar of the Midhurst community for almost 100 years and will attest to the many improvements to Midhurst culture made by groups meeting there, particularly the Midhurst Community Recreation Association, formerly the Midhurst Hall Board. It will encourage stewardship and conservation as Midhurst continues to grow and welcome more modern aspects by preserving a sentimental and treasured community building. Finally, it will promote knowledge of the property by allowing residents and visitors to learn about the rich history of the hall's use in the village. I have also some concerns with the system used by the Heritage Committee to determine whether or not property should be designated under the Heritage Act. The checklist system leads to a low score in individual aspects determining the value of the entire property and doesn't allow the collective spirit of the building to be considered. For these reasons, I would like to request that Council vote to designate the property as a heritage site. I've also attached a petition to this effect that has gathered over 100 signatures in just two days. And there is a link to the petition, which will be provided to Council via email um, through the meeting. And finally, I'd like to thank members of Council who have consulted on this issue. And that is the only question received. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Mahone, for the comment and for the petition information. We'll certainly uh, be addressing that, no doubt, when 7.3 is, I would imagine, pulled when we get to that, which is very shortly. 
So moving on to the minutes of um, <clears throat> council, item 5.1. Can I have a mover to second to get that uh, on the floor, please? Get these on the floor, Councillor Cabral and Councillor Moore. Um, there are minutes one through six. Uh, any comments with respect to any of these? Okay, the, the, the minutes of council listed herein be approved as presented. The special meeting on May 27, 2020. Special meeting closed session, May 27, 2020. The minutes of the special meeting on June 10th, 2020. And the closed session on June 10th, 2020. And the regular meeting of council, June 17, 2020. And the special meeting of council, June 22nd, 2020. All those in favor? Carried. Item 5.4 is the minutes of boards, committees, and organizations. Can I move and second to get that on the floor, please? Deputy Mayor Coughlin, Councillor Cabral, any comments with respect to either of the one or two minutes? Okay, that the minutes uh, of the boards, committees, and other organizations listed herein be received as information. The minutes of the Springwater Township Public Library Board, um, April 27, 220. The minutes of the Public Library Board, May 19, 220. All those in favor? It's carried. There are no, at item six, no correspondence and information items, so that takes us to item seven. Can I have a mover and a second to get this on the floor, please. Councillor um, uh, Ritchie and Councillor Ma Chapman. And which items would like would we like to be pulled on here? Uh, Councillor Hanna? Sorry for the delay, I had to get it off of mute. Uh, 7.3 and 7.5, please. 7.3. And 7.5. <clears throat> okay, anybody else? Uh, Councillor Cabral. You're mute, please. Sorry about that, Mayor Allen. Uh, I don't know if they need to be pulled. I just wanted to have a bit of discussion with respect to 7.8 and 7.9. In respect of uh, being over budget, they both are okay. over budget, but okay. they seem to give different reasons. That's All right, it. we'll uh, we'll get to that noted. Thank Councillor you. Uh, Moore. Uh, Seven point two, please. Pulled. Yes, please. Seven point two. Uh, Councillor Ritchie. Well, I want to speak to the. I don't have the agenda in front of me. I just got the screen here, so I'm not a not a technical, but I wanted to talk to that Midders uh, hall there when it comes up at 7-3, I think. Yep, okay. And there was another one there, I think. Go ahead. I think it might be in the 8th section, and it was about guide rails. Maybe the clerk can tell me when that one comes up. Uh, I wanted to speak to it, too. That's, some, that's later on, is it? Yeah, it that's is. A, yeah. Just okay. let me know when it comes up. For okay. now, I like... All right, well, uh, we've got the 7.3 marked. So anybody else pulling any of these? Councillor Ma? Thanks, Marilyn. I'm not pulling, but I'd like to comment on 7.6 for the uh, person industrial. 7.6. Okay, so we're pulling 7.2, 7.3, So we'll start with... Uh, 7.6, uh, Councillor Ma Chapman, go ahead. This Thank is the Bertram Industrial Expansion Subdivision Agreement Authorization. Thank you, Mayor Allen. My question is just, the, what's the traffic, would it, what would the traffic be like on Nursery Road if, if the entrance is going to be off the Nursery Road side going into the new part of Bertram Industrial? Okay. I'm just concerned I'll turn with the traffic. I'll turn that to Director Coleman, um, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, I guess at this time, I'm not really sure what the traffic would be like as there's no restrictions 
Uh, I think one option for council would be to um, to restrict truck traffic south of that entrance to Highway 26 and um, force the, the any larger vehicles to go north to Horseshoe Valley Road, which is uh, significantly closer than coming to Highway 26. Okay. All right. Uh, follow on, uh, Councillor Ma. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mayor Allen. So we would know more when more development will happen, correct? Is there a, tra there's not a traffic study involved in this at some point, uh, Director Coleman? Uh, yeah, there, there would have been a traffic study. I, I, fortunately, I'm not very familiar with it at this point, but I could certainly go back and review it. Um, okay. Uh, Ainley Group would have reviewed it on behalf of the okay. township. I believe um, planner Chris Russell's on the phone. Uh, can you help us out in that, uh, Chris? Thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, just as Director Coleman has said, uh, as we know what more development or as we know when development occurs or is proposed there, we will have a better idea of the actual uh, truck traffic numbers uh, for each individual lot. Uh, there are eight individual lots in there. Um, uh, to, to speak to Councillor Ma's uh, comments regarding truck traffic uh, heading southwards, this was discussed as part of the uh, uh, the draft plan uh, approval stage, and, and that is something that we are considering. Um, it, it really comes down to how much truck traffic are we going to be seeing out there to the west, and how much can be absorbed uh, on the existing Bertram Industrial. Um, but you. this will be uh, examined further. Thank o you. Okay, 7.8 and 9. Councillor Cabral, I'll let you lead off with that. Here we go. Thank you, Mayor Allen. And I, I certainly realize that uh, uh, the overruns uh, cost-wise are, are likely out of our, our control. Um, just one seemed to reference COVID-19 and the other one uh, just referenced uh, um, increased costs. I was wondering if there might be some sense of where these increased costs came from. Uh, because the money's coming from a different pocket now and it appears that we'll be looking to, uh, to borrow them to, 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 to get the work done. So I, I just was wanting some kind of a sense of uh, um, what caused uh, the increases. Thank you. Um, I believe the increases from the uh, original estimates were in the neighborhood of the high 30 about 37, 38 percent. So, Director Coleman, maybe you'd uh, comment further on that, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor Allen. So, uh, um, a lot of the increases, well, not a lot, but probably a lot of it is related to uh, COVID-19. Um, first of all, the both of these tenders were out in March when we closed the office, so they were cancelled, um, and we retendered them in June. So we're we're kind of three months behind um, in terms of getting decent pricing. Um, and then in addition to the unforeseen costs related to carrying forward, um, we suspect that the contractors are looking for additional um, costing because they'll have to have uh, additional PPE on site. Uh, there'll be provisions obviously related to social distancing. Uh, there'll be smaller crew sizes uh, because of the social distancing, so they'll have a tougher time maintaining the schedule. Uh, obviously a greater risk of delay if somebody on their crew gets sick. Um, in addition to that, construction related costs this year, we're seeing uh, granular and asphalt rates are up about uh, just over 10% compared to last year. And uh, most significant increases appear to be with contract or uh, concrete items. So uh, curb and sidewalk, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of that is uh, 15 to 20% higher than we had anticipated it uh, compared to last year. What Thank would you. happen, I mean, we're talking with the overruns for both of those, 239,000 on one, 195,000, that's $434,000. That's a lot of money to uh, have as a cost overrun. What, what are the alternatives? What would happen if we pushed it back to hopefully non-COVID time? Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, it, it's difficult to say when the non-COVID time would be, I, I think. Um, I suspect that construction in 2021 will look very similar to construction in 2020. Um, pushing it back any further, number one, we're talking about a bridge. I, I wouldn't recommend pushing that back too far. Um, 
then you're looking at cost increases related to, to labor and materials um, in the future, 2021, 2022, whenever that happens to be. So it may, it may end up being the same by delaying it. Um, one option um, is we could go back to one or both of the contractors and ask them to hold their prices, um, award them the contract, but uh, uh, for 2021 at the pri those prices. There's not any guarantee that they will do that. Um, the other option is to uh, work with our consulting engineers on these projects and work with the contractors to see if we can eliminate some of the items, um, uh, change the scope slightly so that so we could realize some cost savings there. Um, those are options that we, we could explore. And if we went ahead with those um, now, uh, they'd be able to start and, and get them done? In other words, they're not backed up with other work? Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, both of these projects, if I remember correctly, have a, a completion date um, at either the end of uh, November or mid-December. Um, these completion dates, if they're not met, are um, subject to penalties, um, which obviously we take off what we're paying the contractor. And um, again, I'd have to check the, uh, the contracts, but the, typically it's between $1,500 and $2,000 a day. So they, the contractor's bidding should be prepared to start as soon as they can. Councillor Hanna. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just for clarification, uh, please. Uh, my understanding of Doran Road, it's one of the roads that's going to be expanded and uh, part of the infrastructure payments, I believe, from the developers when the Midhurst Secondary Plan goes forward. I realize that that might not be for a few more years, but residents have complained that the area in front of the school needs some improvement. I guess my, my thinking is, could we consider doing what needs to be done if in fact I'm correct that the, the uh, developers will be paying part of the in infrastructure agreement to redo the area of Doran Road? And if that is the case, would it be not more practical to do the basic of what needs to be done and then wait for the development to go forward and have the developers pay for those improvements if that is part of the agreement. Director Coleman. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Through you to Councillor Hanna. Uh, Doran Road was not included in the, um, the secondary plan and the EA. Did you catch that, Councillor Hanna? Yes, I did. I, I, I thought it was. Maybe it's uh, Doran Road is, it, it is, I guess for clarification, is Doran Road not in, it, further up then further east? Is that not part of the infrastructure? Director Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, through you to Councillor Hanna. So this section of Doran Road would, would um, start where we left off last year at the crosswalk to the school and go the other way to Highway 27. So what was in the Midhurst EA is from Finley Mill Road uh, easterly. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so we have, um, we've got 7-2 and 7-3 that we're going to pull. So Mayor we have... Allen, as well, 7-5. And 7-5 as well, yes. So we have a mover and a seconder that the action plan reports 7-2 through 7-11 be received and that the recommendations came therein be approved as presented. And that's 7.4 Heritage Register update edition of Kissing Rock. 7.6 PGC Investments Bertram Industrial Expansion Subdivision Agreement. 7.7 .7 Amendment 1 to a Places to Grow, the Growth Plan Township Comments. 7.8 Notice of Award, St. Vincent Street Bridge Rehabilitation. 7.9 PW Doran Road Reconstruction. 7.10 PW um, Aggregate Production Tender Results. 7.11 authorize electronic participation of local boards committees of council during declared emergency with with the exception of 7.2 signs and advertising devices bylaw 7.3 heritage evaluation midhurst community center and 7.5 development of 221 to 225 accessibility plan <clears throat> all those in favor 
That is carried. Okay, moving on to 7.2 in order. Council, um, before we get into that, I believe Clerk Ainsworth, you wanted to uh, uh, mention a couple of things, please. Uh, yes, uh, could we um, get a mover and a seconder? Yeah, can we get a please? mover and a seconder to get this on the floor? Uh, Councillor Moore and Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Go ahead, Clerk Ainsworth. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this report uh, comes forward to Council stemming from um, a motion from Council in 2018 uh, asking for a review of the sign bylaw. Um, this review was completed and an educational session was provided to Council in late 2019. The report uh, outlines the changes that were made to the sign bylaw between 2009 and 2018 um, and recommends that no changes be made to the sign bylaw. Uh, and staff are seeking direction to recommence enforcement of the bylaw. Um, I wanted to uh, reiterate um, that there were no real material changes made to the sign bylaw between 2009 and 2018. Uh, the can, uh, the restrictions were actually um, enhanced and there was more flexibility provided uh, in the sign bylaw uh, than what was seen in the 2009. Um, it was not uh, made more restrictive, which uh, I believe is a common misconception with the sign bylaw. Um, this does stem from two delegations to council regarding uh, contraventions um, of the sign bylaw um, and orders put on by the bylaw enforcement officer um, to those two signs. Uh, and from that, council had requested the, the review. Um, now, staff are seeking uh, council's authorization to recommence um, the enforcement of the bylaw uh, as it has been quite a while that um, that no movement really has been done on signs um, there is the bylaw has been approved by council uh, and staff's position is that it should be enforced um, and we are available for any questions that you may have okay thank you i'll start with councillor moore thank you very much um so I am in favor of the bylaw, except for the recommencing of the enforcement of the signed bylaw to the two people uh, that are named or are not named. Um, so I did send out some pictures today for all of council. I apologize for the poor quality. I'm not a very good photographer, clearly, and it was really hot. But I drove Ward 4 today, and I took pictures of between 40 and 50 billboards on the main corridors, which included MTO, county and municipally managed roads. Um, mostly to educate myself, to take inventory of the billboards and try and sort out why enforcement to take down those two signs located one on Bayfield Street and one at the corner of Wilson and Sunnydale is being pursued. Um, as you may have seen, there's a variety of signs, advertising, sizes, conditions, some in need of desperate repair, political messaging, trailers, stands, hay wagons, you name it, homemade signs, it just really does run the gamut. The first sign I wanna to speak to is, and I, I apologize, that's my dog. <laughs> um, the first sign I wanna to speak to is Jennifer Cameron's at the corner of Wilson and Sunnydale. Um, initially, the, uh, the sign I understand had two businesses on it. Now it's just her own real estate business. Um, and if you've looked at all the signs, there are many, many real estate signs out there on billboards. Lots of folks have those. Lots of examples throughout my ward alone. Um, so it's not in not keeping with other signs already out there. Uh, this is her family's home, which complies with the new bylaw. It's her business on her property. One complaint was received about this sign initially after it was installed two and a half years ago. No complaint has been received since. Uh, she, and she does have county permission to have the sign on her property. So my position is that the complaint was a without substance or merit, um, possibly a competitor with a grudge, who knows? I'm not privy to who complains. But I would like to read to you a quick note that she sent to me. Uh, she says, your worship, uh, Mayor Allen, members of council, township staff and guests. 
Two years ago, I sat before you and explained the significance of this billboard. To recap, our, our farm has been in the Woolwin family for many generations. My father gave me the opportunity to place the billboard on our farm, which otherwise I would not have been able to afford to do as a single agent. The price was approximately $10,000 to make this happen. I partnered with a local moving company at the time. She worked very hard to obtain approval and truly was elated when it went up. It was short lived because she was shocked to learn her sign might be in jeopardy um, after this one complaint. So after the last council meeting, she heard council's concern uh, or staff's concern about sharing the board with a third party. She took it seriously and didn't want to risk the loss of the sign. She's taken over the entire billboard herself. So now it's solely her name listed. Um, so she just goes on to say that, again, one complaint, but hundreds of compliments. People are curious about the history of the Walwyn farm. Uh, she's proud of the connection to Springwater. Um, and she would appreciate the uh, allowing for the opportunity to continue. So that's the sign at Wilson and Sunnydale. Tony Bosiowski's sign. Um, I sent you pictures. I sent you pictures of Jennifer's sign. And then I sent you pictures also of Tony's sign so you could see exactly what we're talking about. Um, for Tony's sign, he's on Bayfield Street and the wooden structure was there when he purchased the property. He changed the outside of the sign only. The structure still remains. It's on his property and it is his business. Um, the sign's not obnoxious. There's billboards across the road from his. It's in keeping with the street. Um, and again, there has not been a complaint received in two and a half years since the initial complaint was received. That complaint, sorry, was a, a neighbor in the subdivision who didn't like the look of the sign. Again, the complaint is, is without merit. It's without substance. Um, you know, most signs that I saw today have no connection whatsoever with the landowner, yet we allow those to continue. So they investigate based on complaints, but the complaints have to be worth something. Um, there are lots of signs listed in growing bylaws without consequence until something complains that we just don't like the look of it. Councillor Moore, uh, we can't hear you. You're fading out. You have to speak into the computer. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, I just, so the signs and the sign owners have to be treated equally. Um, you know, we're giving a lot of power to the complainant, with zero power to the person that owns the sign. I would like to um, make an amendment to the motion that would allow for these two signs to remain. I'd like to consider it a restart because it has been two and a half years, knowing that moving forward, should complaints be received again, that we would have to take another look at those. Um, but I think that proper vetting of these complaints needs to be done in the future. Thank you. So you're proposing an amendment. Um, did, yes. did you uh, capture that? To, do you have a seconder for that? Councillor Hanna. One second. I apologize for my dog. <clears throat> Ainsworth. Thank you. Uh, so I did capture the amendment. Thank you. Um, the bylaw enforcement department works on a complaint basis. Um, the validity of those complaints um, it is difficult to gauge whether it's uh, a neighbor dispute, um, if it's a personal issue. When a complaint does come in, we, we take them all um, as seriously as the next. Uh, this in the event of a future complaint, um, it may be brought to council again 
uh, just the fact that it was let go once, so why not a second time? Um, it would set a precedent for any future complaints or future signs that are erected outside of the sign bylaw um, provisions or allowances. Okay. Other comments? Uh, can, um, <coughs> C. A. L. Schmidt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And further to uh, some of the comments by uh, Clerk Ainsworth, and, and just to hopefully provide some clarity here. So the property that's at uh, on Bayfield Street, I guess uh, Glen Heron actually, uh, is a residential property that is uh, essentially uh, the permitted use on the property is residential. Uh, and where essentially this uh, sign is advertising a commercial business to actually businesses, I believe, that are not even located in Springwater. And so there is some concern there that, again, uh, allowing for a residential property to advertise a commercial business that not a home occupation and not even located in Springwater is a bit of a concern. And it is in contravention of the current bylaw. As for the other uh, sign, my understanding is, and I stand to be corrected, is, is that uh, similarly that sign is advertising a commercial business, which uh, I stand to be corrected as to whether that individual is actually um, providing uh, that service through uh, their, their home on that property. If they are, I guess uh, that's a different matter, but uh, uh, it is a commercial business uh, that's being advertised on a property that I don't believe is, uh, is zoned or, and or um, uh, the permitted use on that property is not uh, for real estate. So those are the two comments I guess I would make and further to uh, Clerk Ainsworth's uh, comments. Again, we do act on a complaint basis. We do have two complaints that whether they're two years old or three years old or a year and a half old, there's still complaints that haven't been dealt with and still need to be dealt with. So the intent of the sign bylaw is to reduce sign uh, pollution at the end of the day. Uh, if you're going to consider these as exemptions, then from staff's perspective, I think council should consider whether or not they actually want to have a sign bylaw in place at all. Thank you, CAO Schmidt. Other comments, please? Mm -hmm. Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Um, thank you, Marilyn, and through you. The property, the home op operated business sign, that is about the same size as a for sale sign for, uh, like for a realtor sign. Is it about the same size? Because these are giant billboards. So even if we were to grant it as a home business, even though the businesses aren't on that location, they still don't comply with the home business sign. Is that correct? Uh, Clerk Ainsworth? Uh, yes, that is correct. Follow on? Nope. Other comments? <clears throat> I certainly... Uh, I agree with CEO Schmidt. <clears throat> if we're going to make an exception for these, then there's really not much point in having a, a sign by law. So uh, um, the reason that these, uh, the reason that these were, um, uh, we've been waiting to act on these is because, well, there are lots of reasons, but we just uh, haven't gotten back to this until this particular point. Councillor Ma. Councillor Ma. Sorry, I mean, thank you, Mary Allen. I'm confused a little, I think. Um, I understand these two signs that Councilor Moore is talking about. What I don't understand is all the other signs that are, have been up for years and years and ancient. Do all those comply with the bylaw? Should all of them take, be taken down? If these two are taken down, is my question. Um, I'll, I'll get Clerk Ainsworth to clarify the procedure for uh, it's complaint based, but I'll let her explain it again. Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, and yes, uh, enforcement of the signed bylaw is complaint based. Um, with a department of two bylaw enforcement officers, it would be quite difficult to um, to enforce all of the signs that might not be in compliance with the bylaw. Uh, we also we don't have a register of all of the signs in the township. Um, as you drive through the township, you can see hundreds as you're just going about your day. Uh, it would be quite difficult to create that register and then go ahead and try to enforce the bylaw on all of these signs. Uh, council, I'll go to Councillor Cabral and then Councillor Moore. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, 
I, I was under kind of like the impression that uh, the non-enforcement was due to basically a review of this particular signed bylaw that um, there was a lot of back and forth going on for a while there. Um, it seems like two and a half years have passed if the original complainants uh, have not indicated anything further. Um, I kind of uh, I'm feeling maybe a reset on, in this particular circumstance might 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 be OK. Um, I also uh, felt based on what Clerk Ainsworth has just said that uh, going around and cataloging all these signs, you pretty well have to grandfather everybody who's got one uh, in, in, into the mix. And I, I think that's a problem onto itself, um, you know, because it was a new uh, sign bylaw. And uh, I guess this particular aspect of it just strikes me as almost a growing pain. So um, I, th I, th I think maybe the bylaw itself, if it's not going to be changed, maybe we should kind of review it and determine who's grandfathered and who's not. Uh, <clears throat> Claire Cainsworth. Uh Thank you through you to Councillor Cabral. Just to clarify, the signed bylaw, there has been a signed bylaw in existence in the township since 2009. Uh, the, the changes made in 2018 were very minor and they added more flexibility to, um, to the bylaw versus making it more restrictive. Uh, the, as we don't have a registry of all of the signs in the township, um, it would be next to impossible to grandfather signs. Um, if that were the case, then the township would need to uh, pretty much say that they wouldn't be enforcing the sign bylaw. It would be next to impossible for staff to identify whether it was in existence pre-existing to 2009 or installed after 2009. Councillor Moore. Thank you, Mayor Allen. There's a couple of things. First of all, we have COVID now. The last thing I want to do is to impose onto somebody uh, to remove a sign for their business when they're already struggling in an economy that's been stricken down by COVID. So I think that's undue hardship that we're going to be imposing onto these two businesses. Um, secondly, I sent you all those pictures out to all of council so you could see how many billboards are out there on property that are not owned by the people that are advertising. Because it's, it's everywhere. Um, and to say that we're not grandfathering them, well, we kind of are. All I have to do is pick up the phone and call Springwater Township and say that I don't like the look of a sign and you're going to make that person take it down. It seems very unfair and very discriminatory. So all I'm asking for is to allow these two signs to have a restart. They've been there for two and a half years without a complaint. I'm not saying give them an exemption. I'm just saying allow them a restart. So from here going forward, if the complaints come in, they're treated like everybody else. Claire Cainsworth. Uh, thank you. And to further clarify the process, should a complaint be received about a sign, uh, staff wouldn't just request that the sign be removed. Uh, further investigation as to whether it would conform with the sign bylaw would be made. Uh, and if so, then the person would be directed to make an application for a sign permit and issued the sign permit um, upon that matter. So they wouldn't just be automatically forced to remove the sign. Uh, the only time that would be enforced is if uh, it doesn't um, provide for the, the proper land use um, planning through the zoning bylaw. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Um, no. Okay. Um, Questions, please. Uh, Councillor Hanna. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, is the intent to act on these dated complaints that are two and a half years old, or are, are we intending to wait until we, there may or may not be any future complaints to deal with these two uh, subject signs? Um, Clerk Ainsworth. Uh, thank you. I, I have drafted the following amendment, if Councillor Moore can advise if this is her intent. Um, so the amendment would state uh, and that the motion before council be amended as follows uh, to add that staff be directed to not enforce the removal of the two noted signs listed in the report unless further complaints are received. That's fine with me. Okay. Uh, Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. And, and through you, 
Um, I'm just I'm just curious at, as to what type of precedent this then sets because now we're saying one like right now we reply on one complaint. I mean more recently with the trailers in in everybody's driveways right now. So to me, I, I understand that. Yes, the complaint is two years old, but sometimes we have complaints that take two years to come into compliance. So I, I, I don't get how the, there, there was a complaint. And even if we didn't update or reconsider the existing bylaw, these signs wouldn't have been and still aren't in conformity. So I, I just am I'm, I'm curious as to how we now are allowing, again, some we're saying that we want to try and create equality to all signs out there, and by forgiving two that are not in compliant, I think then that we need to forgive all the bylaw, all the signs that are not in compliance, because I don't think we can treat one different than the other. Okay, um, I think we've covered it. So, the amendment you just read. Any? Uh, so we're voting on the amendment. Then, all those in favor of the amendment? One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? That is carried. So the, Thank you very much. So the main motion? Go ahead and read it, please, Clerk. Thank you. Uh, the main motion would read as follows. That the report from the Senior Municipal Law Enforcement Officer regarding the Signs and Advertising Devices Bylaw, dated July 8, 2020, be received. And that Council hereby direct staff to recommence enforcement of the bylaw and that staff be directed to not enforce the removal of the two noted signs listed in the report unless further complaints are received. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Okay, 7.3, Councillor Hanna. Heritage well, thank you, of Mayor. Um, first of all, I think it's important that we recognize and, and thank the members of the Heritage Committee for their efforts. Councillor Hanna, Councillor yeah. Hanna, we need to we need to get it on the floor. Are you you're moving it? Yes, absolutely. And seconding it, uh, Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Go ahead. As I was saying, I, I think it's important that we recognize and thank the members of the Heritage Committee for their efforts to uh, review the Midhurst uh, Hall, and they they did this based on their assessment in relation to the uh, form that. Uh, required to fill out certain uh, standards when they're doing these reviews. But I think it's also important that we as council remember that we are the ones who make the final decision on what comes forward and, and what takes place. Um, community halls are important, as we all know, to every community. And I think that going forward, we need to make sure that we make the, the commitment to our residents, to the volunteers and to people who sponsor and donate funds when, when there's fundraising and special events taking place. As you probably know, Midhurst is a very busy hall. It's been um, lucrative in, in generating funds for a lot of things within the Midhurst community. And uh, we, we're all aware what they are. Everybody should have read, and I'm sure they have read the history of the Midhurst Community Hall. Uh, I think Mr. Stewart put some very good, interesting and some things that I didn't even know about that I found very interesting. So. In a short, what I'm trying to suggest is that while we receive this report, we, uh, we uh, make a friendly amendment to it to say that the Midhurst Community Hall will be identified and registered as a uh, heritage property. And I think that would send the message to all of our township and all the community halls that this council supports our community halls, our volunteers, and our sponsors. Okay, um, you have a seconder for that, uh, Councillor Hanna. Are you seconding that, Councillor Cabral? Sure, we'll do. Okay, um, before we do, uh, we have the Deputy um, Clerk Helmke on the line. And uh, she, I believe, has some comments with respect to Mr. Mahone's uh, 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 comments in the question period. Uh, Deputy yeah. Clerk uh, Helmke? Yes, thank you, Mayor Allen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So I'm just going to kind of summarize my report because I did speak to a lot of the points that Mr. Mahone made in his um, question during question period. So just as a quick summary, back in May of 2018, Council Brew approved the Heritage Advisory Committee request to evaluate the community halls, and there's six in total. 
Um, so they did start with the Midhurst call. Um, the evaluation was based on the guidelines that were approved by the committee and council back in 2013. And these guidelines are actually um, regulated under the Ontario Heritage Act and specifically Regulation 906. So there's three equally weighted sections in determining the value of a property for a heritage evaluation and a designation. So those are design and physical value, historical and associative value, and contextual value. Um, so we evaluate properties based on these three criteria, and then we further focus on specific sections under each, which is very common in all municipal um, heritage evaluation guidelines. So I won't go over the point system because it's outlined in the report. But to kind of conclude, so back in October of 2019, the Heritage Advisory Committee conducted their evaluation of the Midhurst Community Centre, um, and they were provided with tons of historical information for not only community members, but the Community Recreation Association, and I want to thank them for providing that information. It was, it was great for the committee. Um, and that can be seen in the October 22nd agenda, which is also an attachment to my report. From this evaluation, on October 22nd, the, um, the committee reviewed everything afterwards. They didn't make a decision um, at that meeting, but on December 3rd, uh, they passed a resolution recommending to council that based on the assessment of the category values, um, that the Midhurst Community Centre not be formally designated as a heritage property under Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act. So this was based on design and physical value, which Midhurst, it scored a six out of 20. Um, specifically, uh, the construction of the building is one of many examples. It was made of concrete blocks with a cottage-style roof. Um, the building is of no distinct architectural style and is not rare or unique. And these are elements that are identified in the heritage guidelines that the committee looks at under the specific focused areas. For, bear with me, for historical and associated value, it scored a 10 out of 20. So the committee recognized that the Vesper Township Council meetings were held there from 1927 to 1967. Um, and then the Midhurst Hall Board was established in 1968 and um, it ran its meetings and uh, had the hall for use for rentals for uh, community members and it scored high in this category because the committee recognized its significance to a person and a group. Um, although there's many events that are held at the hall, there's not a historic event that's been held at the hall and very few properties rate under this guideline um, in that category. And then under contextual value, uh, the committee or the community center scored its highest score, which was a 12 out of 20. Um, the committee recognized that this is a landmark for many of uh, Midhurst residents and the community. Um, the hall symbolizes the community and it served as a focal point for many festivals, events, and a meeting spot for service clubs, sports association, et cetera. Um, in a summary, evaluating a property not only involves understanding the overall context of a community's heritage and how the property being evaluated fits within that context, but it also involves a clear examination of the property for any physical evidence of its heritage features or value. So although it is a landmark to many people, its design and physical value score is fairly low on the evaluation. And for that reason, that's why the committee is recommending that it not be formally designated under Section 29 of the Heritage Act. Um, but as Councillor Hanna had mentioned in his um, proposed amendment, there is the opportunity to always list it on the Heritage Register, which is a different process than formally designating under Section 29 of the Ontario Heritage Act. Thank you, Deputy Clerk. Um, so, Councillor Hanna, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. and, and uh... Again, I'm not challenging the, the uh, committee or, or our deputy clerk. I'm just suggesting that this is an important facility to the community. And I think there has to be more emphasis put on the importance to the community. Um, because we have individuals, as we all are, making our, our assessments based on the form and the criteria that's set out and so on, those are the guidelines. The council has the authority and the onus and the responsibility, I believe, to um, serve the residents of Springwater. The residents of Springwater, as has been pointed out, they have over 100 signatures in two days asking this council to support putting the Midhurst Community Hall identifying as a heritage property 
Um, I'm asking council to um, listen to the residents of Springwater and set an example for all our community halls, our volunteers and fundraisers, to let them know that we're supporting our community halls and we're supporting the residents because all of our halls are important to those communities and I think the importance to the communities should get more emphasis than some of the criteria that's set out in the forums, which are uh, subject to personal um, assessments, if you like. Councilor Cabral. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, I, I have to admit, uh, the other um, reports from the committee, uh, we didn't get, or I didn't get, anyone reaching out to me uh, from the community um, or sending an email to me indicating that uh, we may, may not be recognizing certain, uh, certain things the way we should be culturally. Um, this particular hall, uh, I've been in it years and years ago. I've been in it the last couple of years a few times too, hardwood floor. Um, maybe on the outside, it's not particularly uh, noteworthy, but on the inside, it's full of character to my way of thinking. And, and this particular building isn't just the building. This is a building that has woven itself into the, uh, the community fabric there. And I, I think that speaks volumes that the, the people in the community there are, are, are behind this uh, and that it's not simply just, um, you know, uh, reaching out, looking at a scale and deciding where it fits in because maybe if I had have done the assessment, it might have scored in a couple of areas, maybe a wee bit higher. I don't know what the magic number is, but I think that uh, having these folks uh, really pushing to keep it and all of the people that have been involved over there for decades and decades, I think it really does speak volumes that this particular building does is deserving of consideration by council. Other comments? Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Um, and I did reach out to um, Clerk Helmke uh, as well as um, Hale uh, just to really understand why the need for a petition. Um, I don't see anything even earlier speaking saying that this council needs to keep it. There's. I understand that there will be a new recplex being built and just as there's fear in Elmville that we're going to demolish the Elmville arena as soon as a new one's built, I can understand the, the need to reassure residents that this council supports keeping the Midhurst Hall open and operational. Um, but using a designation, a heritage designation at, as a tool to do that, I think that it devalues not only the, the work that, are, that the group has put in there, but I mean, other halls, I, I, in my opinion, I don't, I don't know if the Hillsdale Hall would meet a heritage designation, but it doesn't mean we're gonna tear it down. Um, I think that the, like you said, the, the petition that came forward and being at events at the hall in, in Midhurst, you're right, it has woven itself into the fabric of that community. And I really don't feel that any council would ever vote to get rid of it because it does serve a purpose. Just like a splash pad or an arena, it is, it is a, a service to the residents that it has and there's operational costs associated with it. And, and that's what we do, we provide services to residents. So in my opinion, this is not a heritage building. Um, I was involved and I will say that there was a lot, it was a very long, lengthy and in-depth um, evaluation. Um, and I, and I, I don't think that putting it on the registry, so from what I'm learning, there's the designation, and then if I could just ask maybe if um, Clerk Helmke could, or even, even yourself, could speak to the difference between placing a building on a registry and placing a building on a heritage designation. Um, because to my understanding, it's not fettering a future council. Any council has, as we know, can repeal it and, and do what they want with it. So I'm just curious in between the difference of placing it on a registry and designation. Thank you. Um, Deputy Clerk uh, Helmke, can you uh, touch on that, please? Yeah, so a designation, uh, through you, Mayor Allen, to Deputy Mayor Coughlin, uh, designation is a formal, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, um, recognition of the property. And 
there's a designation bylaw. It's listed on the land title of the property, and it restricts um, any changes to the heritage attributes, any alterations to the property. There's specific guidelines in regards to if somebody wanted to renovate anything, they would have to go to council. Whereas putting a property on the heritage register, the only formality in regards to that is that if the property owner was looking to demolish that um, heritage property, they would have to make um, an application to council and give council 60 days notice. That 60 day period for council allows them to review and um, make a case for a possible proposal of a designation under section 29. So in this case, council and essentially the township is the property owner. So listing it on the heritage register would just give that 60 day buffer for if there was any um, discussion about demolishing the property. Certainly, um, um, you know, I recognize the, the, the deep history and the contribution by the community. The um, question that I have is, is physically, what, what shape is the building? What, what are the significant capital um, requirements in the next five to ten years for that building? Um, I know that probably would require a study. And that's taking a financial approach, but I think that's got to be considered as well. Um, you know, maybe we we do consider putting it on the heritage registry, so that uh, so that it doesn't lock it in, but it, it protects it somewhat uh, before. Uh, and and there's no imminent sale of this. I mean, we're not going to put up. There, there's not the contemplation of putting putting it up for sale in the in the in the near future. This is just a designation that uh, is being sought. So, C. A. O. Uh, Schmidt, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to members of council. So it's my understanding that uh, we had uh, put money aside in the 2020 budget to do uh, uh, facility assessments on all of these uh, community halls as well as all the township facilities, obviously with uh, some change in, in personnel as well as uh, um, uh, this pandemic that we're in. Uh, things uh, have, uh, have slowed in regards to that uh, assessment. So. Uh, we will still try to get an RFP out before the end of this year to, to try to move forward with those assessments. Uh, and to your point, that would provide some further information uh, for members of council on the residents as to the state of affairs for each of these facilities. I think the other point that I just wanted to make as well is, is just to clarify is that, uh, you know, I've heard some rumblings out there, obviously, that uh, staff have uh, or this notion that staff has made a decision that we're going to sell this and demolish it or whatever the case may be. To clarify, it's my understanding that through the rec master plan uh, update that was done, I believe in 2017 or 2018, the uh, one of the recommendations from the consultant was for uh, the council and staff to consider that. But I will reiterate and clarify that no reports have come from staff that I'm aware of. Uh, and I've been with the township since 2013. Uh, so in that time, I'm not aware of any reports that have come forward to, for council to consider a surplusing this this building and or selling it and or demolishing it. So I, I think the intent is is that further analysis has to be done, whether it be through the facility assessments, and we bring that information to council for their consideration at that time. And if a decision is made to move one way or the other, ultimately that's council's decision. But in no way has staff uh, made a decision and or brought anything to council to state that we're going to, like I said, sell or demolish this, this building. That, that's not true. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Clerk Helmke, um, do you have something to add? Yes, thank you, Mayor Allen. I just wanted to um, say that the Heritage Committee, they should really be commended for, for their evaluation and, and for fairly and objectively evaluating the community hall. They didn't, as Deputy Mayor Coughlin said, they didn't um, go into this evaluation with any preconceived notions. They followed the heritage guidelines. Um, they do have experience evaluating properties. They do so annually for the heritage tax refund program for a lot of our designated properties that, um, uh, that are, have entered into preservation and maintenance agreements with the township. So they do have a lot of experience uh, using these guidelines. I just want to say that um, the guidelines were approved by council and they're there to be fair and objective for these evaluations. Technically, all the community calls have some sort of fabric in our culture and all of them could be evaluated based on what council is probably proposing for Midhurst in that it's strong community ties. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Hanna. Uh, thank you. And just one other thing, too, that I think uh, people who may not know that it was the Minister Hall Board that asked for the assessment of the uh, Heritage Committee. The, one of the objectives was hoping that if it was put on a, a property, was identified as a heritage property, that possibly going forward, we could avoid the costs that, that's needed to make it accessible. I've inquired a number of times if it was identified as a heritage property, whether or not that is accurate, whether we'd have to spend the money to make it accessible, and I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Uh, Deputy Clerk Helm, can you, can you help us out on that particular point? Um, I did pose this question to the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Um, I did not receive a fulsome answer back from them, but from my knowledge, there is nothing that a heritage um, designation provides that's saying that it doesn't have to meet accessibility. Um, accessibility guidelines and regulations come into play when you do any significant or renovations to a building. So if there was any renovations proposed for Midhurst, then we would have to comply with the building code and the accessibility regulations in the building code at that time. So a heritage designation does not circumvent uh, regulations and provisions under the AODA. Councillor Hanna, um, what would you think about a, a friendly uh, amendment to your friendly amendment to, to consider putting it on the heritage registry? Well, as you know, there's a lot of difference between being on the registry and being identified as a heritage property. I did put that motion forward as a notice of motion when this report was first coming forward. I withdrew that when the report from, from the uh, deputy clerk was withdrawn. I think that's something to consider in the future, but again, if the value of being on the registry is far less of an impact as being identified as a heritage property. That's best I can answer that. Uh, Mayor Allen? Yes. Yes, uh, Deputy Clerk. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Through you to um, Councillor Hannah. I'm sorry if I maybe misrepresented what listing on the heritage register may be. It doesn't um, degrade its cultural significance to the community. Um, we list what its significance is on the register, and it doesn't mean that we can't share that history of the community hall. It's just not a formal designation under Section 29, but it does fully recognize the cultural and historical uh, significance of the property. Appreciate the response. Again, I, I don't understand that it was a, the same. The idea is, or the concern is that residents want to make sure their hall is maintained. Being a identified property is different than being on the register is what I understand. Okay, any other uh, new comments with respect to this? Looking around. Uh, Clerk Ainsworth. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to clarify uh, Councillor Hannah's amendment, uh, but first I do want to advise Council that even if the property does receive designation, it doesn't stop a future Council from undesignating a property um, and making changes to that property. Uh, council can designate and they can de-designate a property um, following the process that's listed in the Heritage Act. Okay. All right. Um, further? And further, thank you. Um, my apologies, when Councillor Hanna first proposed his amendment, uh, I was under the assumption that he was requesting that it be listed on the Heritage Registry versus being designated. So the motion that's before Council um, states that the recommendation is to not formally designate the Midhurst Community Centre. Uh, unfortunately, to say to designate it can't be made as a friendly amendment because uh, it's quite it's exact contravention of what the recommendation is and we can't do an amendment to uh, have a direct negative so what i would recommend if councillor hannah would like to pursue it and um, see for council support is that he request a referral to staff uh, for a further report about the process of designating the property um, under the heritage act and that would result in a further report to council to advise of the exact process. Um, we would ensure that that includes various options for council's consideration. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the way the um, motion is worded based on the recommendation of the Heritage Committee, 
an amendment cannot be made to the direct negative of it. Thank you, Clerk. Councillor Hanna? Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. I think failing to do as the clerk has suggested by uh, referring or deferring this would be a, uh, an insult to the residents. So I would ask that that be uh, referred back to staff. Did you get some? Oh, failing to do that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and the seconder is amenable to that? Uh, Mayor Allen, this would be its own motion that oh, would be okay. voted so, on. So we need a seconder for that. Yes. Seconder for that, Councillor Cabral. We'll read it out in a moment. Call yes, thank you. And um, just uh, through you, just for clarification, so the referral then is to have staff come back to council to propose a method to designate this property heritage. So therefore, would it be a reevaluation by a different, like just proposing different ideas like that? Or is it that council simply designate it heritage? Uh, uh, how it's being drafted and what I'm recommending is that staff uh, bring back a report to advise the process of how to designate the property and at that time uh, we would have options listed in the report that council could select um, the option to designate it wouldn't uh, result in a reevaluation by the committee that evaluation would stand but it would be council's decision um, whether to um, designate it um, listed on the heritage registry or not designate so it would be an options report coming forward with all of the okay. uh, process outlined okay councillor hannah thank you and i agree with the clerk's assessment i think the residents and taxpayers and voters are looking for um, a response or direction from their elected officials. So I think that's what the clerk has suggested is what we should be doing. Okay. Uh, to what? Uh, the seconder, Mayor Allen. Uh, yes, Councillor Cabral. If you read that, please, Clerk uh, Answorth. That the motion now before council be referred to staff to provide a further report outlining the process to designate the Midhurst Community Centre in accordance with section 29 of the Heritage Act. Recorded vote, please. Uh, may I just ask Deputy Clerk Helmke if she has any further suggestions to this referral? Deputy Clerk. Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. I uh, note the way that uh, Clerk Ainsworth outlined the um, report that would be coming back to Council is how um, I would be preparing it. Thank you. Okay. I will proceed. I will proceed with the vote. Uh, recorded vote was requested by Councillor Hanna. When I state your name, please state yes or no. Councillor Cabral? Yes. Councillor Hanna? Yes. Councillor Chapman? Yes. Councillor Moore? Yes. Councillor Ritchie? Yes. Deputy Mayor Coughlin? No. Mayor Allen? Yes. That motion is carried. Okay, uh, 7.5. I believe, Councillor Hanna, you uh, pulled that? Uh, yes, sir, I did. You just got me a second to find my question. Um, the development assessment is asking for a response from a questionnaire or survey that the staff will put out by the um, 26th of August. I'm just reminding council of the criticisms we've got in the past from trying to do things during the summer holidays, being July and August. I would suggest that if it's possible, I don't know what the legislation requires, but if it's possible to have a, an end date for that survey 
the uh, end of September. It would save us some aggravation. Do you see any problem, Deputy Clerk Helmke, with respect to that? Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, the only issue that I may have is that the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee uh, next meeting is in October. So in order to get endorsements from them, I would like to prepare that the report and the plan um, be presented to them because then they wouldn't meet again until January of 2021. Um, however, we can move it that uh, the, the plan is not presented to the, the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee until that time. But that means that it wouldn't be approved by council until after that endorsement. Uh, Clerk Ainsworth, is that uh, possible uh, from your perspective? Uh, thank you. Um, I will defer that to the deputy clerk, uh, just based on le legislation, because then we would be into the 2021 year. Um, could you comment on um, what that would mean if the township was not in contravention uh, or was in contravention of this requirement? Deputy clerk. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, so we wouldn't technically be in contravention because our current plan does go to the end of 2020, but we would want to make sure that we had it endorsed and approved by council as soon as possible in early 2021. Um, I will have to double check. I may have misspoke in regards to when the first joint accessibility advisory committee um, meets in 2021. It could be February. I would have to double check the proposed schedule. Um, the other option is that we could call a special meeting of the Joint Accessibility Advisory Committee, and that committee is ran by the County of Simcoe. But in doing so, um, with Springwater uh, requesting that uh, meeting, we would have to pay the fees for the honorariums to the committee members to meet. Um, it's a valid point uh, that Councillor Han has made over the summertime. So. Um, can you draft an amendment to that then accordingly, please? Mayor Allen, may I, may I, may I speak? Please. So what I can do, because it's not, I don't know if an amendment is, is needed for this. What I can do is I can just make sure that the, uh, the survey goes till the end of September. Okay. If we can avoid that, that's good. All right, so we have a, do, uh, Councillor Hanna, you're moving that? Um, yes, sir, I say, I'm just trying to be helpful here because you know the criticism we've got in the past for uh, trying to do stuff during the summer. So got it. whatever yep. uh, everybody's agreeable to, I'm, I'll support it. Uh, seconder, Deputy Mayor Coughlin? Yeah. That the report from the Oh, actually, you go ahead. You're amending it. You're amending it, aren't you? No, you're not amending it. No, that that the report from the deputy clerk regarding the development of the 221 to 225 accessibility plan, uh, dated July 8, 220, be received, and the council support the issuance of a survey to receive feedback and comments from residents and community members as to what the key priorities of the township's 221 to 225 multi-year accessibility plan should be. All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. Okay. So we're moving on to information reports. And um, can I get a uh, mover and seconder to get this on the floor, please? Councillor Moore, Councillor Ritchie. Now, Councillor Ritchie had a question with respect to three guide rail designs. Anybody else uh, have questions with respect to one through four? Okay, Councillor Ritchie, um, your question with respect to item three. This is to, thank you, Mary Allen. This is to uh, Director uh, Coleman. The, uh, the, the proposal from Safe Roads Engineering, if I get this right, is for $2,825 for guide rail repair or, to, or just, can you expand on that further, please? Director Coleman? 
Thank you, Mayor Allen. Through you to Councillor Ritchie. Um, this is for the design of some upgrades that are required at various structures throughout the township. Um, so the, the design portion itself is $2,825 or so. Um, this will get us um, uh, electronic drawings, I guess, that we can use to tender to hire a contractor to actually do the upgrades to the guide rail. So follow on. Yes, thank you. So th this is so we're this money is towards uh, towards drawings. Then is that it, Director Coleman? Uh, thank you, Mayor Allen. Through you to Councillor Ritchie. Yet yeah, for lack of better terms, yes, it's for drawings. Uh, maybe going forward, it would be nice to maybe explain a little further as to uh, what the money's going for. I thought it was towards fixing guide rail, which a lot of our staff, I'm sure, is uh, used to doing. But maybe a little bit more explanation would help. But uh, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that the report items listed herein be received as information. Notice of award, roads need study and structure assessments. Number two. Hydraulic dump hot mix transporter and trailer purchase 220-33-PW. Number three, notice of award guide rail design. And four, extrication tools for station three. All those in favor? That is carried. Next we go to um, verbal reports. And in the absence of uh, Director Spagno, we go to county updates. Deputy Mayor Coggan, any county updates? No, none. Okay, municipal updates. Does anyone have municipal updates? Councillor Hanna? Thank you. No, uh, Mayor, I was trying to ask a question about county updates, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I got a call from uh, residents. There apparently was something on the local television network about um, Simcoe County uh, new waste uh, contract it being for a period of seven years and it was suggested I'm going to understand that by I believe the deputy mayor or the mayor of Brad Bradford possibly suggesting that the uh, county with uh, staff would not supply the name of the the new um, waste management company to the members of County Council and also that the contract is going to be extended for seven years or increased to seven years and it was going to cost twice as much. I'm sorry, I'm just paraphrasing what I was told. I'm just asking, is any of that accurate? Um, County Council um, authorized the uh, going out and, and finalizing a contract with the, and it's uh, there's a report that's a public report um, with respect to this on the last county agenda. Uh, and the award is to Miller Waste, uh, which is a well-known uh, waste disposal company in Ontario. Um, and the details are being, uh, are being negotiated. It's for a, um, is it five plus two for seven, do you remember? No, it's, it's either a seven-year contract, which is not unusual in waste disposal. Um, so any, does that help address your questions, Councillor Hanna? Uh, thank you. Again, I was just advancing a question I'd received, and I will get back to the resident. But I repeat, uh, there, if you look up on the county website uh, under the agenda for last meeting, there's a, a comprehensive report that... Uh, is an update if they want to get further detailed information. I will provide that feedback. I didn't see it on the television network. Okay. Um, so municipal updates. Don't see any hands. Okay. Um, I just uh, a couple of uh, things that we came across our desk today. Um, is the chief still there, Chief Kirk? He's gone. Yes, I am there. You there? Yep. Tell us about the fire ban. So over the last uh, couple of days, uh, or better part of a week, actually, we've been monitoring uh, temperatures uh, 
any rain that we've had. We did receive some rain yesterday in pockets, but uh, the rain wasn't enough, obviously. And uh, we've also been looking at humidity, which is a factor. And uh, we've uh, decided uh, effective today to put a, a burn ban on uh, for the municipality. Okay, thank you. So that's uh, effective today. Um, it's in place now. There's also a water ban and uh, CAO Schmidt, maybe you could just comment on that, please. Or Director Coleman. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, yes, yeah, similar to the situation with the fire department, we've been certainly monitoring the weather. Um, Aqua, the Ontario Clean Water Agency, has been monitoring the flows of our uh, groundwater wells. And uh, our wells are running several hours longer than normal to uh, refill our storage. Um, so we felt that it, um, it was best to stay in compliance with our permit to take water and uh, to be able to provide some storage in case we have a, an unexpected emergency. So we've issued the uh, outdoor water ban for municipal water users only. People on private wells can do what they choose. And it, that's on the website, and was there a press release? So just no watering, no filling of pools, no uh, washing down the driveway, so. Okay. No washing cars. No washing cars, okay. Um, well, we're supposed to get rain sometime this weekend, so hopefully that'll help out. Help out. Okay, um, next, uh, CAO Schmidt was uh, saving himself for the COVID update. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, through you to members of council. Uh, bear with me. Uh, there's been quite a few changes in the last uh, 24 to 48 hours at the provincial uh, Simcoe Muskoka district health unit level as well as uh, township level. So, uh, starting with the uh, with the uh, provincial update. So, as most of you are aware, Premier Ford announced yesterday that all regions in the province of Ontario are now permitted to move to stage two of the province's reopening framework and ongoing discussions continue at the provincial level as to when regions may be able to move to stage three. In addition, the province introduced legislation yesterday that if passed would provide flexibility to make sure that required emergency orders are in place even after the provincial emergency declaration has ended and while the economy is reopening. Further to that, the reopening of Ontario, a flexible response to, a response to COVID-19 Act 2020, will allow any orders in effect under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act to continue for an initial for an initial 30 days after the provincial emergency declaration has ended, and the province can further extend such orders for up to 30 days at a time. Under this draft legislation, new emergency orders will not be allowed to be created. However, it will provide for existing emergency orders to be amended and or be rescinded when it is safe to do so. The province is also looking to extend the provincial emergency declaration from July 15th to July 24th. And as of uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, the township did receive a letter which has been forwarded to all members of council from the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and also the Mayor and myself participated in a phone call this afternoon with the Minister of Municipal Affairs and the Premier, uh, Premier Ford. Uh, regarding new legislation that was introduced today, called COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act 2020, which proposes the following. Enabling municipal councils and local boards to meet electronically on a permanent basis and allow municipal councils to decide if they wish uh, to have proxy voting for their members. Uh, the legislation proposes to finalize the community benefits charge framework. Uh, it would also enhance the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing's existing zoning order authority to provide more certainty when fast-tracking the development of transit-oriented communities. Uh, the legislation or the bill would make it faster to update and harmonize the Building Code Act so that we can break down interprovincial trade barriers. It would permanently establish the Office of the Provincial Land and Development Facilitator to help solve complex land use issues. And the province would also be working on uh, optimizing provincial lands and other key provincial strategic development projects that will help facilitate economic recovery efforts. Uh, so quite a few uh, things uh, in the last 24 hours there. With regards to uh, Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, so similar, uh, I uh, forwarded uh, a letter to uh, all members of council yesterday. Uh, Dr. Charles Gardner, the Medical Officer of Health for the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, announced yesterday that effective Monday, 
July 13th at 12.01 a.m. that all owners or operators of all businesses or organizations and all public transit service providers in the Simcoe Muskoka service area are, one, to have a policy in place to restrict persons from entering or remaining in the indoor space of their business or organization or public transit vehicle if said person is not wearing a face, a face covering. sorry. Best efforts shall be made to only allow entry to customers wearing a face covering. Uh, the face covering must be worn inside the business or organization at all times unless it is reasonably required to temporarily remove the face covering for services provided by the business or organization, such as in cases of eating or drinking. There are some exceptions to this, which include children under the age of two years old or a child under the age of five years who cannot be persuaded to wear a face covering by their caregiver. Uh, furthermore, a person who is incapacitated and unable to remove their face covering without assistance. Next is the wearing of face covering would, uh, if the face covering would inhibit the person's ability to breathe. Uh, next is for any other medical reason, the person cannot safely wear a face covering, such as but not limited to respiratory disease, cognitive dif difficulties, or difficulties in hearing or processing information. And lastly, for any religious region, r reason. Furthermore, the policy should be enacted and enforced in good faith and should be used as a means to educate people on mask use in premises where physical distancing can be a challenge. Appropriate visible signage must be posted indicating that face coverings are required inside the business or organization. All employees uh, are, to, are to be aware of the, the policy and are to be trained on the expectations of the business or organization. And furthermore, where, suffici where sufficient barriers such as plexiglass uh, sneeze, sneeze guards are provided for employees uh, slash volunteers that protect the persons from close contact from a member of the public, a face covering in these situations uh, would not be required. It is also important to ensure the availability of alcohol-based hand sanitizer at all entrances and ex exits for the use of all persons entering or exiting the business or organization. So more closer to home as it relates to the Township of Springwater, to date Springwater has uh, had 13 confirmed cases of COVID-19 uh, of which 12 have now recovered and one has passed. Uh, the Medical Officer of Health did indicate that uh, the uh, uh, Sipka Muskoka as a whole has uh, not had a death since the middle of May, so um, it's a positive. Uh, as of July 6th, all administrative uh, center staff are working on a full-time rotational basis. Each staff member that reports to uh, the administration center has been assigned to a team, A or B, and they are required to attend the administration center on their scheduled day, which is currently every other day, and the days that they are not scheduled to attend the administration center, they are required to work remotely. All staff are available to be contacted either by way of phone and or email. And the main reason for implementing this schedule is to ensure that we protect the uh, staff as well as the public. And should one member of the staff, our staff, test positive, uh, that would mean that we would have a, um, a backup plan and have another uh, uh, team be able to come in and, and help out on a full-time basis. So, uh, staff have been preparing the administration center, the fire station, uh, fire station three, and our public uh, libraries with the necessary infrastructure for the eventual reopening to the public. Plexiglass sneeze guards have been installed at the Township Administration Center, the Fire Station 3, and our libraries. Staff are being encouraged to wear a face covering, non-medical mask, in areas which they are not able to properly physically distance themselves. The municipality will provide staff with face coverings should they choose to wear them. Additional signage will be posted advising the public that prior to entering Township facilities, they are required to wear a face covering and the township will, for the short term, obtain a, a supply of non-medical masks should members of the public not bring one with them. Uh, so in addition to the above, a signage has been installed at the Township Administration Center. PPE and supplies have been or are in the process of being acquired, and training has been provided by way of the township's new learning management system. IT staff, along with our health and safety corporate training advisor, have done a tremendous job of yet again in, in getting this new learning management system up and running. And I will say uh, no cash outlay, uh, no outlay of cash has re been required in order to develop the system. So it has been developed in-house. Obviously staff time has, uh, has uh, been put aside to, uh, to, to get this up and running. But I would just say again, yet another great initiative delivered by staff and, and uh, definitely a cost saving uh, measure there. 
the Township's Community Control Group has been discussing the potential reopening of the Administration Centre and at this point we're aiming for Tuesday, August 4th. This is subject to change depending on what happens at the provincial and local uh, public health level. Um, the last point I was going to or that I'll make is that the splash pad in Elmville did open uh, this past Monday with public health measures in place. However, as of today, with the issuing of our outdoor water ban, this facility has been closed until further notice. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions from members of council. Thank you, CAO Schmidt. Uh, any questions, uh, Councillor Cabral? Can't hear you. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if uh, CAO Schmidt can answer this, but my, my interpretation of Dr. Gardner's uh, uh, correspondence there regarding uh, Simcoe, Muskoka, uh, and uh, the health unit issuing the directive uh, face, face masks will be worn in public places. <clears throat> uh, I got the sense from that that uh, if the emergency declaration is, uh, is uh, finishes or is not renewed, that that particular um, health unit directive also has no, no more standing Am, am I right in the way I interpreted that, CAO Schmidt, or, or, or I'm missing something here? Because then it would fall back to the municipality, would it not? CAO Schmidt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councilor Cabral. Uh, Councilor Cabral, that's, that's my understanding as well, is that if and when the uh, provincial declaration is lifted, then essentially uh, this uh, would no longer be in place, and the uh, medical officer of health would have to consider other alternatives, which... Have, we have had some discussions around the Simcoe Muskoka CAO table along with Dr. Gardner. Um, and uh, again, uh, we've had discussions about Section 22 orders and whether or not municipal bylaws would be put in place. But at this point in time, this is the route that he's chosen to take. And uh, depending on uh, um, the decision of the province with regards to the emergency declaration, uh, we do have another meeting scheduled tomorrow with the, the health unit, I guess, uh, I can share whatever information comes from that with members of council uh, should the topic come up, which I'm sure it will. So, Follow up, please. Yeah, follow on. Uh, the, re the reason I kind of brought that up is um, some of the other municipalities uh, have put some uh, bylaws in place. Uh, some uh, jurisdictions, it's been through their uh, medical health officer. I'm just wondering, uh, CAO Schmidt, if um, there might be an opportunity here to uh, find out what some of these other bylaws, the manner in which they're written, uh, just in the off chance that down the road we do have to put something in place, there might be something uh, available to us that'll kind of give us a bit of a template. That's kind of what I was suggesting. CEO Schmidt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and further to, to those comments, uh, Councillor Cabral. You're correct, and we are starting to look at some of those. Uh, I will state that um, you know, in the discussions that we've had with the uh, health unit to date, um, the majority of the municipalities in Simcoe and Muskoka, don't want to necessarily speak for all of them, but uh, the, the direction at this point is, is that uh, most of us are not wanting to pass a municipal bylaw without um, some directive from the public health unit. If the public health unit does not order a Section 22 order, uh, the, the, the municipalities really don't want to have to pass municipal bylaws uh, right. Most of us don't have enforcement mechanisms or resources in place to enforce such a bylaw. Um, so, like I said, further discussion is going to continue with the health unit. Preference would be is, is that this is a public health matter, and hence a directive should be coming from the public health uh, sector, as opposed to this being more of a, a political-driven um, uh, decision. And so those are discussions that we've had to date, and as I said, uh, uh, we do have a meeting uh, scheduled for tomorrow, and should uh, other information uh, come out of that meeting, I'll, I'll definitely update members of council uh, with that information. Thank I'm, a, I'm Thank on you. a regular call with the mayors of uh, North Simcoe, and we talked about that point yesterday, and uh, it, the common concern was, um, was uh, the enforcement of it, so um, uh, they're not... I think there's only one that might be discussing uh, possible bylaws at a municipal level, but uh, it's it's a wait and see to see uh, the ever-moving emergency expiration date, 
and the, the other uh, announcements from the health unit and the province. So, Okay, uh, any other questions of CEO Schmidt? All right, moving on to uh, notices of motion. Any notices of motion? Item 11, any items for future consideration? Okay, we move on to 12, bylaws. Um, can I have a mover and seconder to get these, this on the floor, please? Deputy Mayor Coughlin, Councillor Cabral, um, that the bylaws listed herein be signed and sealed by the Mayor and Clerk. Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, and through you, can I ask that uh, number 12-2 be pulled to be voted on separately, please? I think you mean one. Twelve two, the, the pulled separately. Yes. Okay, so uh, we're dealing with the uh, that the bylaws listed herein be signed and sealed by the mayor and clerk two twenty. Number one, 220047, repeal bylaw 220027, delegate powers, COVID. And uh, that uh, number three, 220049, uh, regulate tow trucks attending collision scenes. Um, yes, uh, Clerk Ainsworth. Uh, thank you, as well as 2020-048 uh, uh, to amend the procedure bylaw to allow for electronic participation for boards and committees. Okay, that's all three of them, so. Uh, no, the motion would read um, that the bylaws 2020-048 uh, and 2020-049 be um, approved with the exception of bylaw 2020-047. Okay. okay, all right, everybody get that? Um, all those in favor? Hands, hands, <laughs> yep. Okay, nobody opposed. All right, so uh, 220-047, um, Deputy Mayor Coughlin? I'll move it. You need a seconder for that? Councillor Ma Chapman? Okay, and uh, so that is uh, the repeal bylaw 220-027, delegate powers COVID-19. Any discussion or comments? Uh, Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, and through you. I just wanted to reiterate that it is my opinion that the intent of a delegated authority uh, during a pandemic is so that should an immediate decision need to be made, we have the ability to do so. Um, while we do have the ability to meet virtually, we are still required to provide public notice. Um, to use a simple analogy, personally, in a will, I have a delegated authority and guardianship of my children. Obviously, this is seen as being responsible and prepared for the unforeseeable. And that's not me shirking my responsibility as a parent. I don't foresee <coughs> CAO Schmidt using the delegated authority, but I also don't foresee myself dying in a car accident tomorrow. Um, I think that it is irresponsible for us to remove a measure that puts a strategic precaution in place. Um, I do not support repealing this bylaw, and as I stated, the delegated authority is specific to COVID and only during a provincial emergency. This is not a blanket authority. Um, I think that together our staff, senior management council, and our EGC have been municipal leaders through the pandemic, and to quote CBO Ippolito, it's business as unusual. And for as long as their corporation and municipality is impacted by the pandemic, I think that it's our responsibility to have every measure in place that we can. Again, I cannot see a reason to repeal this bylaw as it simply removes a strategic precaution. Thank you. Any uh, further comments? Councillor Cabral? Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, uh, I, I just have to be honest here. Um, there hasn't been an emergency meeting, or not an emergency meeting, but from what I understand, there's been no urgency in making a, a decision. Uh, things have settled down. The provincial government has opened things up. And I think it's uh, it's time, just at the last meeting we discussed this, that the people who are elected to council get on and do their own job. And that is certainly not to uh, say that C.A.O. Schmidt did not do an outstanding job and he continues to do an outstanding job. 
But at the same time, I think council has a duty to do what we were elected to do. There, I don't believe there's any sense of urgency right now where we have to um, allow someone else to take the load off of our shoulders. And I will once again reiterate that CEO Schmidt has done an outstanding job. I think that uh, given the circumstances, uh, far above and beyond what uh, one person uh, uh, could do. But at the end of the day, uh, seven people put their responsibilities onto his shoulders. And I think it's time, uh, uh, as per the last meeting, when this motion was first put forth, that, uh, that council get on and do its job. So uh, I unfortunately uh, cannot uh, support the non-repeal of that particular bylaw. So, Councillor Cabral, how, how would Council work differently to do its, the job that you think it's not doing presently? Well, you tell me, Mayor Allen, uh, why can't Council do the job it was elected to do and we have to um, uh, uh, rely on CAO Schmidt to do it for us? Uh, I, I can't see how we have not, as a Council, been doing our job as a Council. That then, well, once again, Mayor Allen, with all due respect, then why uh, do we require someone to have delegated authority, sir? Deputy Mayor Coughlin. Um, thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, I think that just as past council uh, delegated authority, this council will be delegating authority again as we come up to an election. Delegating authority, as I said, is not taking it off your shoulders. You are still the authority. It basically just puts that backstop. So as we move forward into the next election and we come into lame duck, this council will be required to delegate authority. So we will be doing it again. So that how can we say that during this pandemic we're not doing our job? That basically tells people that as we move into the next election and we have to delegate authority again, that doesn't mean I'm not doing my job or we're not doing our job. It's like an insurance provision. Anyways, oh. Uh, okay, I think we, uh, so um, the, we're about to vote for this bylaw uh, in favor means a, a repeat. I think Councillor Moore wanted to speak, Mayor Allen, sorry. I didn't see your hand, Councillor Moore. Oh, sorry. You see when you hold it up against that wall behind you, it blends in. Sorry. Yeah, you got to wave. Thank you, Mayor Allen. I just want to say that I, I'm not sure we want to rehash all of this again. We have already had our chance to say how we felt about this last meeting, and it was voted to um, to repeal the bylaw, and I think that's what should go forward. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Mach, uh, Chapman, and then uh, CAO Schmidt. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, I understand where everyone's coming from, but and I know we have not, haven't had any emergency from the beginning. My concern is why not keep it in place until COVID, well, it'll never be over, but even slows down more in case it comes back because it, they're calling for another break outbreaks. So my thought, keep it in place. We still have the authority, the council, but this is for emergency only. And I'm glad that we haven't used it and, and CEO Smith is, is doing a fabulous job. So my thought is there's no harm to keep it in place. Thank you. Thank you. CEO Schmidt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so feeling a little uncomfortable, to be quite honest with you with this, but uh, I don't want to uh, beat a dead horse, if you will. But again, the intent of the, of the, of the authority that was requested back in March was due to the uncertainty of, of, of the situation at the time. And so at the time, it was a safety net or a safety guard for the township. And as discussions have happened at the last council and this council meeting, you know, uh, things are starting to open up. Uh, there could be a second wave, and, and we'll deal with that if and when it comes. Uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, my preference would be is that all members of council uh, vote in, in the same fashion regarding this bylaw. At the end of the day, we need to show solidarity amongst the group. I realize that may be tough, but from a staff perspective, uh, all members of council being supportive of withdrawing the bylaw and or supporting the bylaw would be preferable. I am in support of withdrawing the bylaw because at this point in time, I don't foresee any uh, decisions that I'm going to have to make uh, through the delegated authority. And again, uh, you know, things can change on, on, on a daily basis and if we need to implement the bylaw again or a similar bylaw and or if we have to declare an emergency then we'll do so but at this point in time I just 
uh, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable, and, and, and I'll leave it at that. So. Okay. All right. Uh, so those in favor of repealing the bylaw based on discussion. One, two. Excuse me. I'm not sure exactly. Are we voting to withdraw the powers, please, or are we uh, repealing the, the bylaw so the council is back to doing its job? Could you please explain? I'm confused here. We're, we're voting on the uh, one twelve dot one sub one, as it's stated there. Fine. I'm voting to keep it. Okay. All those in favor? Oh come on! Eh? Okay, that is carried. Thank you. And confirmatory bylaw item thirteen. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Coughlin, seconded by Councillor Ma, that bylaw 220-050 to confirm and adopt the proceedings of the council at regular meeting held on July 8th, listed herein, be signed and sealed by the Mayor and Clerk. All those in favor? Carried. And a motion to adjourn. Councillor Moore, Councillor Ritchie, that the regular meeting in Township Springwater does adjourn at uh, 8.30 p.m. to meet again regular meeting august 5th 2 20 6 30 p.m council chambers admin center menacing all those in favor carried thank you